So I want to welcome everybody uh, to our public informational meeting number two for the I-91 viaduct study. Uh, so welcome introductions. My name is Ethan Britland. I am the project manager uh, for MassDOT. I'm in the planning department. Uh, so I'm the, uh, the primary point of contact for the study. Uh, to my right, uh, Mark Aragoni uh, from Malone McBroom. Uh, and then we have across the board here on the side, we have Patrick, who's from MassDOT, Tim, Malone McBroom, Van, uh, Brian, and John. So, I'm sorry, Rich, my mistake written I should have known uh, so part one uh, is going to be a presentation by uh, primarily by Mark uh, so we're going to go over uh, what's happened uh, to date with our working group meetings uh, how we got down to the three alternatives that are across the back of the room uh, we're going to get into next steps for our study and uh, we actually had planned a, a part two open house which seems to have organically happened before the meeting but uh, we still are going to open it up to the open house afterwards especially since after you've seen the actual presentation, you'll probably have more questions, and uh, so we'll be available for that. I also wanted to say that, um, again, this is a public informational meeting. Uh, we have uh, working group meetings, which are uh, invited stakeholders, and uh, so there's different, two different subsets. This is de definitely to get more of the public input, and uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to stress is that this is a conceptual planning study, uh, this is not project development, uh, it's not engineering, so we're, we're looking at this at a very high level. It's planning uh, interlaced with engineering, so this is what you're looking at here. The end result of the study is not a construction project, it's a set of recommendations uh, with which uh, to move forward into project development. I just wanted to be clear on that because it can oftentimes be confused and if you show something, graphics like this, people may actually sometimes think that they're currently moving forward. These are just things we're looking at a part of our study and uh, we're gonna continue to analyze them. Uh, so uh, this is our study purpose. Again, uh, it's a conceptual planning study and as I said, at the end we'll have recommendations uh, that we hopefully can move forward into project development. Uh, another, I guess, uh, at a more detailed level, uh, we want to look at highway alternatives uh, with primary goals of uh, moving traffic uh, safely and efficiently on I-91. Uh, we really want to enhance the viaduct's presence. We understand it's a physical barrier, it's a visual barrier, and it's a psychological barrier. So whatever we can uh, examine in our study to improve it uh, is, is positive. And uh, we want to improve safety for all modes, not just vehicular, but bicycle pedestrian. And uh, we also want to um, improve connectivity between the downtown and the riverfront because obviously there is a viaduct and there's a rail line, there's limited crossings and, uh, and it is a resource. So that's something where uh, we've been looking at. Um, this is our study area. So uh, we actually have two study areas. We, uh, the green outline is what we consider our uh, regional study area and that's uh, intended uh, to when we look at alternatives, we want to know how our alternatives affect um, the transportation infrastructure regionally. Uh, but as a primary study area, uh, it is the I-91 viaduct um, in the central core of Springfield. That's really what we're looking at. Uh, our alternatives are, um, are changing or affecting. <coughs> uh, this is our study process uh, real quickly. We have done a lot of work. Uh, we have our task one, which is setting up, you know, obviously our study area we just showed, our goals and objectives, what is it we're trying to achieve, uh, our evaluation criteria, how we're gonna look at our alternatives, measure them, and then our public involvement plan, which uh, this meeting is a part of. We have our uh, task two, and that's really to uh, collect all of our data, analyze it, and see what we have from a, an existing condition snapshot. And from that, we can develop what our problems are or what we feel are issues. Uh, we also try to identify opportunities and constraints and from that base, so task two is really a base from which we uh, launch into alternatives development and that's at a high level. We look at what kinds of things do we want to improve, lines on maps, um, connectivity, and so we're in alternatives analysis right now and that is taking uh, the alternatives development at a high level, winnowing it down to a more manageable and realistic uh, set of alternatives, which are the three that are across the back there. Uh, so we're actually in analysis, so we're actually going to dig more deeply now into these alternatives. That's what we're in, in the process of doing. 
uh, in this meeting here today is to tell you what we've done and uh, get feedback from you. Uh, ultimately, we will have uh, recommendations. We will be coming back out for another public meeting and uh, the product of the report um, is, is, a, is a final report. I'm sorry, the product of the study. Um, so this is roughly what we've uh, completed. And again, a lot of this is task related. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, public health. Uh, we are working with Department of Public Health to integrate uh, public health considerations into our alternatives process. Um, this is actually sort of a pilot. We've worked with DPH in the past, but we're um, continuing to work with them on developing health in all policies. And um, so this is uh, sort of digging more deeply into the re review of the work on the actual um, alternatives. So we had uh, preliminary concepts, those are just the line drawings. Uh, we're looking at potential impacts and benefits of them. Uh, so we have some high level themes that we looked at from a development standpoint. Uh, we also, I should note that we are looking at short and medium term improvements as well. So while a large part of this presentation is going to be looking at the viaduct as a whole and what kind of transformative changes uh, could be made, uh, we also try to look at what kinds of short and, and medium term improvements uh, we could implement uh, on a, in a shorter time frame, uh, less costly and less environmental permitting and design. Uh, and then we have had plenty of working group discussions, uh, lively. Um, as Ethan mentioned, uh, Mark Aragoni, I'm the principal in charge with my Elena McBroom. Um, I'm actually a landscape architect, not an engineer, not a planner. So I have a very interesting take on this project. And it's always nice after nine or ten meetings to look out in the audience and see the people who have been consistent members coming out to the working group meetings, coming to the first public informational meeting. But I have to say tonight, it's nice to see some new faces. Um, we're looking forward to some input from those new faces. Um, a lot of times, these, pres these turn into just presentations. We took a different stab, as Ethan mentioned tonight. It was great to see the discussion happening before. I'm going to try and not talk too much tonight, because a lot of the detail is on the boards. We have a full staff that everybody met here. Feel free to approach, whether it's Rich or Tim, and ask questions if they're standing next to a board. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is bring you and tell you a story basically of the last 11 months or so on how we got to where we are tonight. As Ethan mentioned, um, we put together a lot of line drawings and those are basic, very simple concepts. Um, we wanted to get them down on paper. We wanted to start to look at what, what some of these impacts would be and which, which of these options that people have talked about over, over the years um, have merit and figure out should we continue and should this go to the next stage? So what we've done is we, we've taken these line drawings, some of them we've looked at, looked at the impacts, um, looked at the realistic, the feasibility nature. Some of them did not move forward to that next iteration. And this has been a long process. So where I wanted to start was um, working group meeting, I believe it was five, right around there, um, several months ago where we really sort of took the next step turned those line drawings into actual widths of roadways, widths of highways, looked at lanes, looked at on and off ramps, um, came back to the working group and said, we did this extra effort and we think that some more of these alternatives are going to fall off the table so we can focus our efforts on some more that are, are very feasible. And at that point, an at-grade option of the viaduct we took off the table. And that was simply taking the elevated viaduct, bringing it down at grade, removing any of this structural elevation, not bringing it below grade, not depressing it, not tunneling it. That option had a lot of impacts associated with it, um, both physically, mentally, you name it. We took that one off the table. Um, we also investigated um, tunnel only option. We looked at um, a Route 5 bridge connection, basically looking at taking the South End Bridge, constructing a new South End Bridge in a better alignment than the one that exists now to look at alleviating traffic. As part of that removal process, we also looked at taking off the table several of the options that actually either split the flow of I-91, keeping I-91 northbound flow on the Springfield city side, taking the southbound flow north of the city and bringing it onto the Route 5 corridor or the West Springfield side. We looked at a lot of different options. So just to show everybody who hasn't seen these before what the level of detail was that we looked at, what you're looking at is a north and southbound split, 
of I-91 south of the city and north of the city. We looked at carrying the northbound split that would go on to the Route 5 side up the Route 5 corridor. We also looked at taking that split and not going all the way up the Route 5 corridor on the West Springfield side, but coming back over into the city, the northern part of the city, and tying right in with um, Route 91 again. So we looked at a lot of different options, weighed the benefits and weighed the impacts of each of these. We talked a little bit about the Route 5 connection, uh, a new bridge, which was looked at and proposed here. Just for reference purposes, this is the existing South End Bridge. So what was looked at was a realignment and a direct connection of Route 5. This is the Springfield Long Meadow border here. We looked at a connection here and a, a direct tie-in to 57 to Route 5. What, what the study sort of paused at, and I think it paused at good reason, was the feedback we got at our working groups. I think Ethan had mentioned that they were, they were lively working groups, and that's what working groups are supposed to be. You're supposed to get into discussion. So as I mentioned, these were taken off the table, but what MassDOT and the project team um, was directed to do was, well, we listened to the working group. We needed to look at removal of any west side options a little bit deeper. Um, so what we're showing here is, an, is another step to this planning process that happened is we actually looked at the alignments of a Agawam West Springfield Route 91 option in much greater detail. Um, looking at property impacts and what you're seeing here is is a graph hierarchical of red being direct impacts or property acquisitions, the orange being um, more indirect impacts, and the yellow being it's going to have impacts to the surrounding community. Um, did we do full engineering drawings? No, but we can make um, engineering assumptions and that's how we develop the impacts. And it was a, it was a good back and forth process. Um, the consultant team and MassDOT looked at these, developed a uh, technical memo that's available. It's posted on the project website. Um, and after some discussion, this option was removed um, for further discussion, which left, left us with three main alternates that we needed to look at a little bit further. So what they were were a sunken tunnel or combination following the current I-91 alignment. So we didn't quite know if it was going to be fully a tunnel, partially sunken, sunken and covered, how much were we actually going to cover, where was that section going to be covered, but we generally knew that we needed to look at an option that followed the I-91 alignment through the downtown core. The second alternative was a sunken or tunnel or a combination thereof those that actually looked to amend or take out the bend in the downtown area of Route 91, and it's very visible. I'll show you in a couple minutes on a graphic, and we can look at detail in the second part of the meeting. Um, that's really what, what that second alternative looked at. And the third was maintaining an elevated viaduct, but knowing that we're looking 20, 30 years out, maybe it's not reconstructed in the same manner that, it's, that it is now. We may have the opportunity to elevate it a little bit more, um, use new construction techniques um, to expand the pier spacing, uh, maybe consider a downtown signature bridge section that could really push out the pier spacing and allow one of the goals that Ethan had mentioned, a more free-flowing connection to the riverfront. I mean, that's one of the primary goals. So not all the alternatives that we're looking at are depressing the highway. One of them is still maintaining it in an elevated section, but looking at modern techniques um, and ways in which to make it more attractive. And then we'll also, I'll also get into a little discussion on the short and midterm alternatives that are also part of this study. So if you remember the line drawings that I showed you, this is the next step that we took looking at those three alternatives. A little more detail, actually looking at on and off ramps, beginning to really look at creation of spaces by shifting the highway alignment, sinking the highway alignment, removing some of the on and off ramps to be able to work better with the, hi the realigned highway um, or the sunken, sunken highway. And we started to put together um, illustrative sections to describe what we're talking about. And this is simply looking at, well, here's your downtown city moving toward the Connecticut River. Here's a newly aligned frontage road or east and west Columbus. Here's your sunken highway section, immediate to downtown. 
with a cover on it that would allow for more of a pedestrian friendly connection within that downtown core area where right now you have an eleva elevated viaduct and a parking garage. 991 North Garage, 991 South Garage. So again, and this was a sunken alternative following the existing alignment. If you, if you know or are familiar with the area, there is definitely a hook in the I-91 alignment. We were going to follow that, but look at vertical change in elevation. The second alternative is following a modified alignment. And just to be clear, that modified alignment of I-91 is really focusing on that hook in the downtown area, pretty much where the where Memorial Bridge comes over and hits Bowling Way. There's a definite um, geometric change in I-91 right there. This option actually looks to straighten that, uh, that, that bend out and move the highway corridor to the rail corridor, looking at a combined transportation corridor. Um, one of the primary reasons we looked at it that way is if we bring those corridors closer together, it's a closer crossing session, section um, for pedestrians to get to the riverfront. Um, and if we were looking at options that you'll see of actually covering that depressed highway section and potentially covering the active rail lines to, to look at trying to promote a connection to Riverfront Park um, by bringing them closer together, that becomes more of a uh, feasible option that we wanted to push forward. And alternative number three Maintaining the same highway alignment, um, but looking at rebuilding the highway viaduct, keeping it elevated, but looking at modern construction techniques, being able to space the piers a little bit further, uh, maybe bringing the elevation a little bit up, um, looking at cleaner construction methods so we're not just looking at box beams, bringing that elevation up, as I mentioned before, bringing more airflow. And we looked at um, some design details where we actually laid out the spacing very simple diagram laid out the spacing that exists out there now, um, which is the black line. The green line looking at a, a couple foot elevation change in that downtown area, bringing it up in elevation to allow more light and airflow underneath. But as you can see down here, we also looked at the ability to push the pier spacing out to allow for more activity underneath those, underneath the actual viaduct. But not everybody understands drawings in, in two dimension. Not everybody understands elevations. So throughout the process, as many of you know, we tried to find examples of what it could look like. And you'll see them on the boards and you'll see them throughout the presentation. Here's an example. Um, I can't quite remember where this is in the United States, but that is a modern elevated highway structure um, with a very attractive pedestrian space underneath it. Um, if you can imagine Close your eyes and imagine 291 and 91, where hypothetically that will still be elevated in most of all, all of our alternatives. There's still hope. There's still a chance that that could become an activity area where right now it is not. But on top of the major um, items that we've been investigating, we've also been looking at some smaller ones. And I say small, some of them are still some pretty heavy lifts, but we can look at them as actual separate projects. And that's, that's key. I think one of them that we'll probably focus on a little bit later is the long metal curves. Can that be a standalone project? We think it can be, and we've taken care to make sure that our designs sort of show that as a, as a separate project. But these are some ones that we looked at, under viaduct safety and aesthetic improvements. Um, providing a better access, so it's simply a more attractive, safer access to the West Columbus Corridor and the development parcels that have been developed over there and the development parcels that still remain over there that just haven't come to fruition yet. Um, access to the waterfront. We are not only dealing with an elevated viaduct structure, we're also dealing with an active rail, dual line active rail. Um, as I didn't go into detail, but in our line drawings, um, we actually looked at hypothetically relocating the rail um, to the West Springfield side. Um, for a lot of reasons, although we got it on paper and it's documented, moving the rail is something that we felt is just not a feasible option to consider. Um, so it's something that we need to continue to look at in how 
we can not make the rail such an impediment to getting to the waterfront. And we're, we have a whole bunch of ideas on how to do that. Currently, there's only three access points, none of which are really good to get from downtown Springfield to the waterfront, even to Riverfront Park, to the Connecticut River Bikeway. Um, there's only three. As you're looking at, um, this is one of them, um, a below grade access that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, not very attractive. Um, however, it is paved. Um, ve vehicular emergency access can get there. Um, and the city of Springfield is actually now looking at improvements um, to, this, to this point. Um, the upper right-hand photo is the current at grade crossing to Riverfront Park. Um, if you were to look at this uh, for safety measures, it probably should not be there. Okay, that's not going out on a limb. Um, it probably won't be there for very much longer. Um, accidents probably will happen, and it is also something that the city of Springfield is actively looking at in conjunction with making another access um, to the park. We were looking bigger term as maybe not improving the existing accesses, but looking at maybe potentially going over, um, making more broad access. So we're not looking at access points. We're looking at an area where you wouldn't think it was an access over the rail because you're going to be in a park environment. So that's, that's sort of the mindset that we've taken all along. But we've also looked at pretty detailed improvements. Here we are looking at adding a right turn lane um, at Forest Glen and also revising the timing at Route 5 and Forest Glen Road, actually in Longmeadow. Um, we studied as part of this um, process, we detailed study the, Van, how many intersections? 45. So we looked at 45 intersections that will be included in the future modeling. Um, so we're gonna know how those intersections are affected by these three alternatives. But as I mentioned, we also looked at what are some of these bigger infrastructure or highway related projects that could be separate projects, one of them that we can look at in greater detail um, is how we're going to fix the long middle curves. What are our ideas? It's not really just the fact that it goes from three lanes to two. And in all these options, we're making that three lanes in either direction consistent. But we also have several parcel, inter parcel interchanges in that long middle curve section. Um, so we spent a lot of time in figuring out we actually have made it into two intersections with some frontage road that I welcome everybody to come over and spend some time and look at and let Van show you exactly how that circulation goes. Um, we've presented it a few times on the board. I think that the ability to get up and walk around and actually see it and touch the map is a better way to go. <clears throat> but we're also looking at the movement from 291 to 91. Primarily 291 heading westbound getting on to 91 South. Right now it's a left-hand exit. Um, we all know that there's that, that wish that you want to merge and get off of the, uh, the downtown exit. Um, that left-hand exit is something that we want to get to the right-hand side. So we've looked at um, two different options have made it this far. So if we're coming down 291 and we want to get on 91 South, this is a new high elevation off-ramp that eventually comes down, gives access to the Memorial Bridge, and also allows for a merge on ramp onto 91 South on the right side, literally and figuratively the right side of the highway rather than the left side. Um, Ethan mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, it has taken um, quite a bit of time, but it's all for a good purpose of this study to include as many of the public health determinants, public health pathways into this transportation study. Um, the mindset has historically been do a separate health impacts assessment after the transportation study um, has been completed, but DOT has had the foresight um, to begin to try to include as much of the public health aspects of the evaluation criteria into this study in the forefront. And I think that makes a lot of sense um, it's been challenging. We're still not there, but we're getting there. I think every study that gets done is getting a little bit further um, because as Ethan also mentioned and very early on, the idea is we want to come out of this study with projects that can be supported um, and become actual projects. So having that public health side of it is very important. A 
I like to put this slide in there in the beginning after we talk in the middle after we've talked about some detailed things and, and we just can't forget about that this is really a balance. Um, Ethan mentioned it's not engineering, but I can tell you there's a lot of engineering that's been involved in it. There's a lot of planning elements that have been involved in it. There's been a lot of community involvement and looking at neighborhoods. There's been a lot of socioeconomic, um, economic development aspects that Tim will be able to talk to and how that all is being um, combined into the study and into the regional modeling that's going to be done so we can figure out which one of these alternatives seems to work better. As part of the development of all these um, alternatives, we're definitely looking, we're creating spaces that do not exist right now. Either we're moving the highway um, to a different location and where that highway was, um, we're freeing up some land, most likely land for economic development or land for open space adjacent to the Connecticut River. And these are all things that are incorporated um, into the plans. So the next several slides are really iterations, same exact thing that you can see and touch and get close to and understand and see the lanes. You may need a magnifying glass, but I can tell you that the shoulders, the lane striping, everything are on these plans. Um, Van probably knows them by heart, Rich does too. I don't want to spend a whole lot of detail going through them here, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to set you up so that you understand at least what you're looking at. Um, but we're going to really put some emphasis on the walk around and the mingling um, that can happen afterwards. So again, we're looking at three alternatives. You can see the graphics have begun to change. We started to look at green space. We started to look at green space where we could actually get some vegetation to grow. Um, and this is the first time where we actually started to look at economic development um, pads, parcels. You see the brown boxes up here. Spatially, we know we're creating space. We know we're providing access now to some parcels of land that didn't have great access before, and we know they're going to be better suited for economic development. So this is a transportation planning study. However, we know that there's, there's economics involved in it, and we know we're, we're going to create um, a better opportunity for this to happen, so we wanted to include it. So what you're looking at in these maps around the room, we have them set up. Um, this red square is a zoomed in focus area on the 291-91 interchange in the vicinity of Avocado Street, the Connecticut River Bikeway. Um, so this is really what you're focusing on in here, 291-91. The centralized area is really focusing on where the Memorial Bridge um, comes in, turns into Bowen, Ray, Bowen Way, intersects with East and West Columbus, um, and how we're dealing with those alternatives are focused on that central area. And then this red box over here, we're calling that the, the focus area along the long metal curves. So that not only looks at things that are happening in the long metal curves, it also looks at some ideas that we're considering for the interchange with Route 5, 57, um, where the actual uh, traffic circle is now. So again, we're looking at alternative number one, and now we're going to zoom in to the 291-91 interchange. And you can start to see, we looked at hypothetical parking. We looked at hypothetical, the brown squares and rectangles that you see there are potential building development pads. Now, do we know exactly how many stories these buildings are? No. We don't yet. We're going to have a pretty good idea as we move on in this study. But what the intent was, let's look at spatially. We're going to have to have parking to support it. We're going to have to have, we, want, we think we can have some square footage um, to match with what the existing zoning is now and also what the opportunity to amend some of the zoning and invite some new types of development within these areas. So what you're looking at and what you'll see throughout there is potential um, development. And we simply highlighted them with A, B, and C, and E, F, and G, um, with just a little key of what we're envisioning these could be. So on this particular option, um, what's shown in brown around the vicinity of that A star is about a 60,000 square foot um, footprint of building. Now we can assume, based upon where it is, it could be industrial, it could be manufacturing. I'll get into a little bit more detail on how we're actually going to explain what those are, but at this level in the study, we wanted to start to get some ideas of what are we dealing with with square footage? Because eventually, 
we want to understand it a little better so that we can apply the traffic that's generated out of that and the people that are generated out of that into our regional modeling that we can um, imply on the roadway. So generally all the maps that you see around the room will have this discussion topic to give you a little bit of a better understanding. So as we move from the 291-91 map, we move into the sort of the downtown city core map, which just for highlight purposes, we have the Memorial Bridge here and I-91 in this general vicinity. What should jump out at the map of everybody here is where did 91 go? Well, in this particular option, we are following the same alignment of I-91, but from this, this line to this line, the highway is going down in grade and will be fully depressed and covered through the downtown core area. From this point down through what's shown in gray is the MGM development block all the way down to Broad Street. Where Broad Street is, the highway will then come back up and where the black line is on the far side of the highway is where that highway will be back up to an elevated grade basically where that highway elevation is now. Big change. Now, as I mentioned a little bit before, <clears throat> we also have the rail line that's shown in the dark gray that runs off the edge of the Connecticut River. <clears throat> and I showed the line drawing of basically an elevation, how we can get up over it. Well, in plan view, the idea is that we would completely cover the rail and potentially have economic development on top of that. So although the highway is sunken, the rail maintains at the same elevation, um, I included the sections for, for informational purposes in the back so you can actually understand what we're talking about um, in grade. So for those of you who are very familiar um, with the area, as you come from West Springfield over the Memorial Bridge, you are now coming into Springfield come over the bridge and the roadway dives down and goes underneath I the I-91 viaduct. I believe it's a 13 foot, eight inch clearance right there, which is pretty darn low. Um, envision that highway or the Memorial Bridge coming over and not diving straight down to go under, but envision it coming off at a, at a, at a gradual grade and coming down and meeting the elevation of Bowen Way roughly at East Columbus. Now imagine the highway fully sunken. So you're not staring at the highway anymore. You're staring at the city. You're looking right down Bowling, Bowling Way at that moment in time. That's what we're trying to show. Also what we're trying to show is if you're at that location where you're staring down Bowling Way, the highway is now gone, to your right, right now where you look in the distance you see Riverfront Park, what you will see is a park space or an economic development pad at the same elevation that you're at on the bridge for a certain um, for a certain distance and that's what's shown in this area right here and again we can get into more detail so I don't want to belabor it here but I just want to give you some reference points to try and understand what we're showing the other big things I ask you to pay attention to is we have definitely shifted and removed some on and off ramps. Now through the working group process, our first iteration when we came back, we took out quite a few of the on and off ramps in the downtown area because that was something that we felt if we can get the traffic onto the frontage road, it's a benefit. But we had good discussion in the working group and we added some on and off ramps back into each of the alternatives and they are called out. We have an off ramp that comes from a depressed I-91 South and pops up onto the frontage road, basically at the Union Street intersection. Adjacent to that, if you wanna get out of the city and get on I-91 North, you're able to get on, take a left onto Union Street and go down undergrade, uh, underground and get on I-91 North. So these are all called out on the plans in detail in the back. Um, but just know that we did try and clean up the amount of on and off ramps within the downtown area. The third focus area is, that we're referring to is the long metal curbs. Um, there's quite a few things that are going on um, in this section. As I mentioned before, we really um, spent a lot of time not only as maintaining three lanes of travel in either direction or along, along the long metal curbs, 
but also cleaning up the amount of on and off ramps within a short vicinity. Um, I won't do it a lot of justice if I, if I get into the actual inner workings of what we commonly refer to now as the peanut interchange here and how it connects into Route 5. Um, you can see the circular area, the circulator um, at the end of the South End Bridge and how that all works. But the idea is that we're going to create frontage roads on either side of each direction of I-91 travel. They'll be at a different elevation, as you can see, both this shape, this peanut interchange, and the circle interchange up there are both above I-91, so they're going to be higher in elevation. Um, again, we can get in more detail when we get back to the maps. Also, we talked about we do go on to the Agawam West Springfield side. You are all probably familiar that this is the traffic circle that sits here. Um, we took a different take on removing the traffic circle. Yes, we did look at creating a flyover um, from Route 5 to 57, um, but right now this is the option that's on the table for us. Uh, we're looking forward to getting all the modeling completed so we can see how this functions, um, and Van will be more than happy to explain the intricacies um, of what's happening here. Um, but basically we're making the 5, the Route 5 movement, the through movement, um, and we're actually creating intersections um, for 57 uh, in that location. Alternative number, number two. Now you will see some things that begin to look a little similar, um, but also know that there are some parts of each one of these alternatives that, that are interchangeable, that one could work with the other, but there are also some options that you may like that may only work with one of the alternatives. So if you have a question like that, feel free to ask one of us. So the big change with alternative two is we're changing the alignment of the highway and moving sort of the crook in the highway in downtown, moving it closer to the actual rail line. We're calling it a shared transportation corridor. Generally syncing I-91 in the same parameters that's shown in alternative one, but it's in a different location. And what happens when we move and adjust the uh, highway alignment is we start to get a little bit different shape on what we're creating as far as land area. Could it be open space? Could it be economic development? So again, focusing in on the 291-91 interchange, we looked at a different um, alternative to create a better on-ramp situation from 291 to 91 South. Um, the big, biggest difference with this option is it does not provide an access to the Memorial Bridge because of the shift in alignment, the grades, where the rail is at this, this moment in time. Um, it provides a direct connection onto I-91 South. Um, however, we could not at this level get it to connect back into the Memorial Bridge. This is where the, the two alternatives <coughs> differ significantly. Again, Memorial Bridge, what you will see is through the downtown central area. Um, you will not see the highway because it's sunken. But you can also see that here's your rail corridor, here's your highway corridor, right next to one another. Um, again, highway and rail corridor covered um, in that general location with some economic development shown on top of it. But we took a different look at what happens at the end of Memorial, Bull, uh, Memorial Bridge before you get to Bolin Way, and we looked at, at moving traffic similar to how it's moved um, on the other side um, of the bridge in a roundabout or traffic circle way. One of the biggest benefits of this obviously is we're creating a revised or revamped East and West Columbus Boulevard in both alternatives, um, both being able to take on a complete street mentality. These are pedestrian friendly. Yes, they're gonna carry traffic because um, the intent is we wanna bring people up who know where they're going in the city um, but we also want to make those roadways streetscape friendly, green space on both sides. Um, hypothetically, as we get up into the, the highlighted G over there, um, those parcels of land right, right now, they look at an elevated, either an embankment of the highway, a retaining wall of the highway, or an elevated structure of the highway. If something like this were to happen, or shall I say when something like this would happen, it's going to drastically change 
what those properties are looking at. They're going to be overlooking basically a park space and two new um, frontage roads, um, sidewalks, uh, bike lanes, bikeways, landscaping, things like that. So that's why we felt it necessary that if we're changing the, the appearance, we're going to change the development um, potential of those parcels. And we want to make sure we account for it because we want to get as real as a number of people, traffic that we actually can. So if we didn't show any economic development on here, we wouldn't be doing any justice to trying to forecast some of the, the volumes of traffic that we would be putting on these streets. And then we get down to the long middle curve section, which will, will look very similar on all three alternatives. Reason being, we're really trying to focus on this being a midterm alternative, which could become a breakout project. And the last alternative is keeping the elevated viaduct in the same alignment, but thinking 20, 30 years down the road, can it be reconstructed in a way um, that's much more attractive um, than it is now? Some things that we want to also consider is, do we need both the I-91 North and the I-91 South parking garage? The I-91 South parking garage right now is sitting in the way. It really is an obstruction. Um, visually, airflow, light, you name it, to connecting to the riverfront in that downtown core. So something we want to consider is maybe we keep the I-91 North garage, we remove the I-91 South garage, we make sure we can account for the loss of that parking, um, but the benefits involved in opening up that space where the I-91 South garage is um, are significant. So again, focusing and marching our way through the 291-91 options, um, knowing that even if, the elevate, even if the highway stays elevated in this area, we still want to have a project that can fix that, that 291 to 91 South left-hand merge. So we're still continuing that, that thought process through. We also know that throughout this process, we can open up some access points to the rear of Avocado Street. They're gonna make those parcels um, more viable for development. Moving through the downtown, now you can see the highway there where in the other alternatives um, it was green, had some economic development on it. But we also looked at uh, modifications to some of the ramping systems. So I invite you to take a look at, even though this one doesn't look as exciting um, as an alternative because we're not depressing it, I want to emphasize the fact that there are some pretty significant things that could be done, removal of the I-91 South garage reconstruction of the viaduct in the downtown core um, with some new construction methods that are cleaner, um, more attractive, potentially even some development underneath the highway. We always talk about above development rights. Well, there's plenty of examples on where below development rights could actually happen too. Um, so there's, even though it looks pretty simple um, in plan view form, take some time and understand what could happen underneath that um, with a better constructed viaduct. And again, even though the viaduct would remain the same in, in an elevated fashion, um, the fixes proposed for the long middle curves and that traffic congestion that exists out there now can still be part of this project or a standalone project. Um, and I'm gonna ask Tim uh, Baird to come up and talk a little bit about this one. We've sort of kept him in a cage for a while, um, but this is really, people ask, why are we showing these development pads? Well. Besides they, they complete the picture, um, there's also some information that we need to get into the modeling to better understand it. So Tim. Thank you, Mark. As, uh, as Mark said, my name is Tim Baird. I'm a planner who's worked on this project. Um, as Mark mentioned, these, the development pads that we put on the ground there, we first approached this from a, an urban design perspective in terms of what are the development sites, how, how do they respond to uh, the new areas of land opened up under these different alternatives, um, what kind of connectivity options do we have to them, and what could we see happening in that space that would be uh, a benefit to the community and a way to really take advantage, in, especially in the alternatives one and two, uh, of the new land uh, that might be available, whether that's towards the downtown core side or towards the riverfront. Um, start taking those development pads, though, as, as a po starting point, we took a look at the zoning, we took a look 
uh, towards uh, what, what certain mixes of uses would fit in well with the ongoing re, uh, revitalization of downtown Springfield. And look to say, okay, based on this, let's crunch the numbers. Let's see how many square feet would be fitting into these areas, approximately speaking. Um, based on different allocations of housing, different types of uh, commercial spaces that could happen in those, uh, on those sites, how many jobs might we see in this area? What kind of population increase could we see? Um, and really trying to plug in those numbers. Um, when we test those against uh, what we see in the region as a whole in terms of the long-term uh, economic and population forecasting, it helps us get a sense of how this would fit into uh, your larger region's uh, economic picture, its demographic picture. And we've been collaborating recently with the UMass Donahue Institute, uh, has some very savvy market research folks there um, who are helping us test this against both how they see the long-term um, future of, of uh, the local market from a real estate economics, uh, from the economic fundamentals that drive job and population growth in this area. Um, and also see how other communities that have seen uh, major changes to the highways uh, and opportunities to open up their riverfront assets and really make uh, some new spaces that uh, bring new energy to the downtown area um, and see how those, those cities have responded um, to that redevelopment and try to, try to understand really is this market feasible? What extent of uh, the sites that we've developed, uh, designated as development opportunities, what proportion of that might we see uh, actually moving forward, given one of these realignments? Um, based on the results that we see from them, um, we're going to be looking to uh, plug those numbers, really refine those numbers, um, sharpen them up, and then plug those into our modeling of both the local and the regional impacts, whether that's uh, at the levels of the demographics of folks on the ground there, um, the employment and economic uh, trends, and in particular, the shifts in travel demand, whether that's at the very local level in our micro simulations or at the more macro level of how uh, travel demand is changing uh, across the region there. And that's critical to future-proofing each of these design alternatives, ensuring that they have adequate capacity. Um, and it's also important in uh, the health impacts work that Mark mentioned, uh, in understanding that uh, so currently this is uh, downtown Springfield's population is an environmental justice population. Uh, we want to ensure that the impacts from uh, both an environmental, from a health perspective, um, from added economic opportunities, um, and so forth, uh, that, that we're taking into account the changes in that population and the changes in the job opportunities that would take place in proximity to downtown Springfield. Um, so all of that, uh, you can see there's, a, there's sort of a clear flow. Right now, we're, we're sort of wrapping up the market testing piece of it. Uh, we're going to be cashing out that, those results in terms of the jobs, people, and households, and really looking at that in terms of the broad impacts on Springfield and the region. And I'll turn it back over to Mark. I think I'll give you a real technical term. One of the neatest or coolest parts of this project is this has been done in other places. So you could look at the plans and say, oh yeah, well, you know, that's pretty aggressive. But the beauty of what UMDI is doing, and it's sort of a shift that we gave them a little bit of a different direction is they're looking at other places um, within the United States, not just within the region, at where some of this transform transformative change has happened. Um, so we're going to be able to base it on some real numbers. Will they match exactly the demographics of Springfield? Um, no, but it's going to be their job and our job to take those numbers um, and get them as close as we can. So it's not something that's really pie in the sky. We're actually going to base this on um, some other transformative projects um, um, within, within the United States. So it, it should be pretty interesting, and the idea is we want to forecast and be as accurate as we can. Again, planning to that 2040 time frame okay next steps Ethan you want me to just finish it up perfect okay you went too long in the beginning so I'll go in the end <laughs> okay so as Tim mentioned we're we're gonna get that forecast we're gonna plug that in we're gonna run the transcad modeling um, on the three alternatives that you see in the back 
um, we're going to learn some things because that regional model, um, Van is then going to take the, the, some of the outputs of that one and we're going to look at how it impacts those 40 plus um, intersections and, and see how they function. Um, we made some engineering uh, judgments on some of these alignments. Um, we've had some good feedback. I think we have a pretty good idea um, that these will work, but we may learn some cases where we might have to make some adjustments and some shifts. And again, knowing that we're still at a concept level, um, everybody should understand there's been, there's been a lot of work and there'll be a lot of work that goes into making sure that at this level um, things, things function. We spent a little time um, talking about the evaluation criteria. Each one of these alternatives will be put through the evaluation criteria process, um, which will help us understand and eventually come to a preferred option. Um, maybe the preferred option will be alternative one or alternative two or alternative three. Um, something tells me that we may be taking a piece of alternative one that may work with alternative two and that there may be a little, little bit of a blending. I don't know that yet, um, but we're going to get to the point where we do know that um, so we can make some recommendations. So although we are at our 10th meeting in the process, uh, we do still have two more working group meetings. Um, and just for show of hands, if you, if you are on the working group, I think it's okay to put your hand up just to show that you're on that working group because a lot of you, most of you have been pretty consistent attendees and, and I thank you and I know that MassDOT thanks you for coming to all those meetings. Um, when we get to a point where we're wrapped up and we think we have that, the recommendations, we're gonna come back, we're gonna publicize again and we're gonna try to get all you back um, to present that, that recommendation. Um, and give you a little bit more detail on just that one. Where we are in the project schedule, uh, we are sitting right here. So all this is happening. I know this schedule did not look like this consistently all the way through. Um, we've adjusted it based upon things that have happened and occurred, um, but everything that has happened and occurred, I think is gonna make this a better project in the end. It's gonna have better, more accurate findings, and hopefully everybody that was part of that working group and part of the public meetings feel like they had the opportunity. Um, eight, nine working group meetings, I would say, MassDOT has given the opportunity to be part of the study, and that's important. So we're here, uh, we're gonna be doing the modeling, we're gonna be uh, refining recommendations. The intent is in that April, May time frame, we're gonna come back and, and give the public um, another presentation on and the final final product so a little over 45 minutes we didn't do bad um, what we'd like to do now is get back into that mingle walk around ask questions um, get your glasses out do the squint technique there's a lot of information on these plans take some time the way we're set up we tried to set it up just like it is out in the field starting from the north 291, 91, um, getting to the sort of the heart, the city core, Memorial Bridge, 91, Bowling Way is station two. Uh, station three, uh, right behind my friend Jim Zack over there is really the Long Meadow Curve area. And that gets, then it gets into sort of the economic, the social side of it, where Tim gave you a little bit of a, a precursor on that. He'll be able to ask, answer um, some more detailed questions if you have them about how some of this economic development and this socioeconomic impacts actually are tied into this study.